Hey everybody, it's Mr. Fuderen. I want to welcome you to this live stream tonight um, on the first and second great awakening. Before I start, can you guys hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. This uh, this stream is brought to you by Fiveable. If you don't follow Fiveable on Twitter, uh, you should. To, uh, they constantly post articles, resources for AP students, uh, times of the links, and information that everybody can use. Maybe you don't have Twitter, you like Instagram, they also do that on Instagram. And uh, you can also follow Think Fiveable on YouTube. I personally uh, really like Twitter, and you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, so that would be, I hope to uh, get a new follower tonight, all right? Today we are going to be talking about two topics. Um, basically, the Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening, and the Second Great Awakening. Now, these are topics that students don't necessarily uh, get into. Uh, they're not the most exciting topics in the world, but they are constantly tested on the AP exam. Um, a, a while ago, about two years ago, there was a question on the Second Great Awakening, and I felt bad because I actually didn't really spend that much time on the second great awakening with my students. I just kind of said, guys, look, I, I rarely have seen a question about the second great awakening, so don't even focus on it. And I made that mistake. And it actually ended up being um, a question. And so I want to make sure that you guys are ready to go. And I thought before you even talk about the second great awakening, we need to focus on the first. So the first great awakening is part of standard uh, period two. Uh, period two, remember in AP U.S. history, we had periods one through nine. Period two covers this part right before the American Revolution. And period four is where we are. So thumbs up if you are on period four or thumbs down if you're not on period four yet. Libby, welcome. Guys, I'm so grateful for you guys. Julia, okay. Julia, what, per uh, what period are you guys in over there? Vicky, all right. Is anybody past period four already? Two thumbs up if you're past period four. Wow, Jacelyn. Jacelyn, welcome to the chat and thank you so much for being here again. Okay, Libby, so you're almost done with it? Well, so I want to go and start off uh, real quick. In the Great Awakening, we're going to cover two great awakenings today because I, I, it's, it's really hard to teach the second one without understanding the first one. And if you're up to period four right now, uh, you are 37% of the content. You've seen 37% of the content already. If you're in period five, you're at 50% of the content. And I will say, look, as an AP student, if by December you're by period six, or per even period five, your teacher is doing an amazing job. And I know that sometimes there's always a question of like how fast to go. I, I wanna you know, make sure my students are getting the information, but also that we're moving forward. So it's always uh, really tough. Julia, don't, don't worry about it. Ratification of the constitution, uh, period uh, three. So you're right there. And trust me, teachers can fly by uh, uh, other periods and you're gonna be just fine. So I know you're a little bit ahead, but thank you for joining me. And Libby, where, where are you uh, logging in from? Florida, all right. So um, I wanna get started. And here's the agenda for today. And I'm gonna put a document here for you guys, a free document uh, that you guys can use to study. Now, I, rem I know that I always talk about this every stream, but um, studies just show that if you write things down, I know some of you guys really like to take screenshots and maybe just pay attention, but studies show that if you write things down, you're way more likely to remember it, not type it out, not uh, take screenshots. It's actually writing it down with your hands. And so I want to encourage you guys, um, to, to write things down, and, and, and as we go through the stream, I'll point out some key information, and then when you're studying for the AP exam in May, you can go back and review this information. Well, I put this document there. Uh, this document is a compare and contrast chart that I made, and it's going to help you understand the, the, 
first great awakening and the second great awakening. But we'll you come back to it later, but I just wanted you guys to have access to it. So first, let's review the first great awakening. But before I start real quick, so, um, most of you guys, I think everybody has copied it. What do you remember from the first great awakening? Let's do a brain dump real quick on the chat. What do you remember from the first great awakening? You can remember any names, uh, peep, uh, events, maybe the dates, sermons, anything that you remember. Let's have a brain dump. Go ahead and add it to the chat. All right, George Whitfield, absolutely. Jonathan Edwards, Vicky. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, written by Jonathan Edwards. This is one of the most famous sermons, and we're going to look at a little, little bit of it today. Good job, Jaceling. Anything else? Does anybody remember the dates of the First Great Awakening? Okay, Jocelyn, exactly. And we're actually going to talk about the old lights and the new lights. So if this is, uh, if you're not sure, we're going to cover that today. The Enlightenment ideas. Okay, yeah. Uh, Vicky, actually, or Libby, that actually is an influence on the Great Awakening. You're absolutely right. And we're going to briefly talk about that. Okay, does anybody remember the dates? It's actually right here in the agenda. I shouldn't have asked. But it's 1830s to 8, 17, I'm sorry, 1730s to 1740s. And we're going to talk real quick about the first Great Awakening. So if you have some notes, I would be writing some of this down. And just like Libby said, in the European philosophical movement, as the Enlightenment was making its way across the ocean to, Amer uh, to the American colonies. And the Enlightenment is starting to influence people because it's saying that reason and thought are very important and that people uh, can think differently and that's okay. And so the Enlightenment is, is, is kind of setting the mind, uh, the, the framework for the Great Awakening to occur. Second, throughout the colonies, the church attendance is declining and the colonies are all divided. Now, does anybody remember how many colonial regions there were? And can you name them, the three colonial regions? Oh, I just gave you. All right, sorry. There's three. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, guys. There's three colonial regions. Can you name them? Remember the three colonial regions? Julia, New England colonies. That's one. Perfect. Uh, so, Jocelyn, the New England and the Middle Colonies, you can call them also the Chesapeake Bay Colonies, that's fine, and the Southern Colonies. And so, this second point right here is that all the three colonial regions are really split up. And they're split up religiously. And in the 1720s, a revival begins to take roots, and preachers begin to change their message. Uh, so, before that, to, I'm sorry, to emphasize Calvinist, Calvinism. And before that, church was kind of boring. And so the preachers decided to change it up because people weren't coming to church. And so they changed the way they're uh, preaching to people and they actually go to people. So we're going to talk about that. Somebody brought it up. Jonathan Edwards. Uh, let me see who brought that up. Uh, Vicky brought that up. Jonathan Edwards begins preaching about the ideas that humans are sinners. God is angry and individuals need to ask for forgiveness. He also preached that uh, you can be saved by uh, faith alone, that you can't do anything to save yourself. You're saved by faith alone. Here's another one that uh, Libby brought up. George Whitfield, a minister from Britain, uh, toured up and down the colonies. And in one year, he preached more than 350 times. Uh, he preached to common people, slaves, and Native Americans. And so the first great awakening starts off with these ideas of the enlightenment that people can think and it's okay to think differently. Uh, you can be open minded and then churches are declining. The attendance is declining. And so the preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, they change their methods and they come to the people. Now, this is very important. So I, great. So Julia Calvinism is 
basically the belief that everybody's predestined. Exactly. Exactly, Zoe. Thank you. That everybody's predestined. And the idea is that I, I the moment I'm born, God already knows if I'm going to go to heaven or I'm going to go to hell. And so Calvinism is predestination. This is going to be challenged later because people say, no, you can be saved at any point. Anybody can be saved. But Calvinism is basically you're saved um, the moment that you're born. God already knows. So thank you, Zoe, for answering that. Excellent question, uh, Julia. So here are some major themes, and I would write these down. So the, some major themes of the Great Awakening. First, that all people are born sinners. You and I are born sinners. Sin without salvation will send a person to hell. So the moment you're born, you're a sinner. And unless you get saved, you're going to hell. And hell is a terrible, terrible place. Jonathan Edwards was famous. And we're going to look at it for describing hell and how terrible it was. All people can be saved if they confess their sins and seek forgiveness and accept God's grace. All people can have a direct and emotional connection with God. And religion shouldn't be formal, but rather casual and personal. And here's one of the most famous pictures that you'll see when talking about the Great Awakening. Uh, this is George Whitfield. And look, this is really informal. He's out there preaching um, in front of the people. There's even a dog here in the crowd. Uh, but people are, this guy's even drinking a beer. <laughs> uh, but it's very informal. This isn't happening in, in a huge, huge church. This is happening outside in the woods. He's just standing on a, a, a on a brick. Okay. Okay, guys. How you guys doing? Thumbs up. Everybody okay so far? All right. Awesome. Cool. Hey, Crystal. Welcome. Angela. Brian. Welcome. All right. So here's one. Uh, somebody brought this up. I, I need to see who brought this up because I like to give people credit. Uh, Jason, you brought this up. This is one of the most famous sermons by uh, Jonathan Edwards. And it's probably the most quoted sermon from the Great Awakening. So if there is a question about the first Great Awakening in the AP exam, more than likely it's going to be from this sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And so he gives this, this sermon, and I want you to listen to the language of this. Uh, how, how fearful, he's trying to basically say, look, you're going to hell unless you turn to God. So here goes. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or a lonesome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is a pure, of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful vehement venomous serpent is in, in ours you have offended him infinitely more than our ever i'm sorry more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment and so this is designed this sermon here is designed oh daniela this sermon here is designed to scare you uh, he's basically saying jonathan edwards is saying that god is holding like think about you catch a little spider in your house and God is holding you over this, over the pit of hell. Imagine you're holding a little spider over a fire. The only thing keeping that spider from being burnt is this little tiny pinch. And he's saying, and God doesn't even want to look at you. You're so hideous. You're uglier than the ugliest snake. <laughs> Maybe uh, I, I take offense to that, Jonathan. I don't think you're talking to me. <laughs> Julia, don't worry. He's not talking to you. Um, and so he's describing this as saying, the, the message here is basically the only way you're saved is through faith. Nothing you do. You're so ugly that God does, you're hideous to God. And so this is the tone of the sermon. So not everybody. So I want you to let's review real quick. So we've gone over the main themes of the first great awakening. Uh, we talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God in the tone of the sermon. Now we're going to talk about, somebody brought this up, the old lights versus the new lights. And who brought that up? Correct, Stephen. So the audience was people who are sinners, uh, people who weren't saved yet. And so basically it was, you're going to hell 
God hates you. Uh, well, God doesn't hate you. Sorry. God, you're hideous to God. You're uglier than the ugliest snake. And the only thing that's going to save you is faith. And people would be like, all right, I want to be saved. And they would come. Uh, they would convert. So it was to instill fear. So not everyone embraced the ideas of the Great Awakening. One of the leading voices of opposition was Charles Chauncey, a minister in Boston. Chauncey was especially critical of Whitfield's preaching and instead supported a more traditional, formal style of religion. So not everybody is for this Great Awakening. Preachers and followers who adopted the new ideas brought forth by the Great Awakening became known as New Lights. Those who embraced the old-fashioned traditional ways were called Old Lights. So people that liked just the traditional, you're going to church, you sit down, uh, you know, you're not preaching outside. Those were called Old Lights. One of them was Char Charles Chauncey. And the New Lights are the preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And they're the ones that are coming to the people. And so there's this disagreement between old and new lights. All right. So what were the major outcomes of the Great Awakening? First, uh, so what came of this? The Great Awakening helped spread the idea that all people are equal in God's eyes. And this was a challenge to the system of monarchy. Why was this a challenge to the system of monarchy? Why was saying, hey, you're equal in God's eyes, challenge a monarchy? One at a time. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I've got to keep myself uh, entertained here. All right, Zoe, exactly. It would lessen the power of the kings uh, because every, uh, if everybody's equal, then just like Vicky said, then where do you get divine rights? Monarchies ran on a system of hierarchy, correct. Julia, don't worry. It's basically that uh, the kings and queens, they live off the, 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 the idea that they're better, they're closer to God than everybody else. The Great Awakening says, uh, no, you're not. We're all equal in God's eyes. And second, it, the Great Awakening encourages ideas of liberty, equality, and resistance to authority. This would contribute to the colonists' desire to reject the king of England. Okay, so I'm going to skip something real quick. Everybody cover your eyes. Oh, my God, cover your eyes because I want to go to a question. And here's a question from the AP exam. Uh, well, it's a practice question from the AP exam. And I want to give everybody a second to write out the answer. So this is what would be on an AP exam. So we're going to practice. This is a short answer question. So briefly explain the historical context of the event being depicted. Don't put your answer yet. I want to give everybody about a minute and 30 seconds to write out your answer in the chat. And then we're going to post it. And guys, we're just practicing here. It's okay if you have a wrong answer. Uh, it's better to be wrong here than to be wrong on the AP exam. So here's a, uh, a again, don't start yet. Here's a question from the AP exam, a practice question, using the painting above to answer the following questions. Briefly explain the historical context of the event being depicted. So everybody, please answer question A. I'm going to give you... One minute, 30 seconds. I won't post the clock the whole time. Maybe I should, huh? Maybe I should. So remember, the uh, each question in the, in the short answer is one point. So the most possible points you can get here is... Uh, three points. Okay, you got about 30 seconds. I didn't realize how awkward this was going to be. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. I uh, need to keep myself entertained. And then I want to ask for a volunteer if they can come on and read their answer. And remember, guys, it's just voluntarily. 
volunteer and it's just to get somebody on there. So would anybody be willing to come up here and read their answer? Remember, this is practice. All right, Julia, is that a thumbs up that you'd be willing to come on? Ah, oh, Julia, all right. Uh, Zoe, Vicky, Julia, all right, no problem. But let's just practice. Zoe, would... okay, go ahead and post your answers. Okay. Uh, so definitely one thing that you want to notice is this is George Whitfield. If you can bring up the name of the preacher, you autom uh, in the AP, they give you, uh, when you're grading it, they give you a list, and that's one of the points. So definitely he's preaching. Uh, you could say this is George Whitfield. He is standing on there. The context is that he's preaching to a large outdoor venue, kind of like Libby, ha uh, <laughs> Libby has it. This is challenging the traditional way that people preached the traditional way that the old lights tr uh, preached versus the new lights. Remember, if you bring the vocabulary in there, that's what's going to get you the points. All right, let's try number two. Explain one specific result of the event being depicted in the painting. So what was one result of this picture? So I would say, let me see. Steven, you're almost there. You started off well. I, this one would be tough to give you a point for that, but you're close. Uh, if you could identify George Whitfield and the historical context uh, is basically that the, the, the Great Awakening is challenging the way people think about government. Well, we do have that. And that they're changing the way they preach to people. Uh, no, he was not the, the city on the hill guy. That's John Winthrop, co correct. But it's okay to get all these guys confused. Uh, Estrada, would you be willing to come on here and read your answer number two? All right. So explain one specific result of the event being depicted. What was one result? <laughs> Don't worry. It's all right. All right, Angela said it led greater independence and diversity of thought and encouraged people to political authority. If you said that, that would be a point. If you said it challenged the hierarchy, or I'm sorry, challenged the monarchy, and uh, and it made people question whether or not the king had this divine right to rule, that would also be a, a point there. And finally, the last one. Any? Oh, actually, anything else? Let's, okay, it was kind of like individualism, but look at this, oh, never mind, I'll have to go back. Um, it, it also expanded church attendance, it increased the number of people that were hearing the gospel, um, and it changed the way people were, were, were preaching at that time. So explain another specific result different than your answer in part B. So what can you talk about? Jason, kind of it, it. One specific result is you can talk about here the challenge to the old lights versus new lights. Now, remember, guys, in the AP exam, they're going to ask you to kind of bring in all this information. If you're vague and general, it's going to be hard. Different religions were merged, such as Calvinism. All right. The introduction of that word Calvinism is good. Let's go back uh, to this example here. Remember, one some of the outcomes, it encouraged ideas of liberty, equality, and resistance to authority. This would contribute to the colonists decide to reject England. So I would say the more specific that you are, the more likely you are to get a point. We're going to practice a few more. So let's keep going. Now we're going to go. Actually, before I start, how's everybody doing? Everybody with me? Yeah, uh, Libby, uh, Whitfield would get huge crowds. Thousands of people would come out to see him. 
All right, Angela, you're with me still. Thank you. Everybody else, Jaislyn, thank you. All right, so I'm just going to read this. You don't have to write this down. The second great awakening was prompted. So now we're going to move on from the first great awakening to the second great awakening. Jocelyn, what's wrong there? Oh, come on, cheer up. You're doing great. All right. The second great awakening was prompted by falling interest in religion when people were excited about innovations of the Industrial Revolution and the rapid expansion to U.S. territories, particularly in the West. So basically this is saying people were so busy with the Industrial Revolution and westward expansion that people stopped going to church. So the same sort of thing that happened in the first great awakening, the decline in church attendance, is happening in the second great awakening. People did not have time or the inclination to worship. Exuberant revivalist meetings ignited the interest in religion. So it's this the second great awakening is categorized by huge, huge meetings that will last four to five days. These preachers would come out, they would set up, and all these people would camp out, sleep there, and for four or five days they would just preach, and these were called revivalist meetings. The camp meetings feature zealous preachers who applied Christian teaching to the resolution of the social problems of the day. The Second Great Awakening began in 1800 and was in decline by 1850. So real quick, uh, I'm going to keep asking you guys questions just to check. The First Great Awakening occurred when? Justin, can you hear me? Okay, 1730s to 1740s, and the Second Great Awakening happens from about 1800 to 1840s, to the 1840s, okay? Brian, perfect. So it's important to remember that the dates give you a, a, a basic approximation. The Second Great Awakening sought to awaken the conscience of people. It sought to change the beliefs and lifestyles of people by the adoptions of the virtue of temperance, fragility, and the ethic of hard work. It also sought to awaken people to the plight of the less fortunate. So the second great awakening um, is trying to tell people, okay, it's not enough for you to convert yourself. It's not enough for you to believe in God. What are you going to do with that? And what society, what problem in society are you going to fix? So this is a big component of the Second Great Awakening. It wasn't enough to save my soul. Now what do I do to make society better? Okay? That's a key. The Second Great Awakening aimed or instilled in people a desire to make society better. Um, it also sought to awaken people uh, in the less fortunate society, such as slaves, convicts, and the handicapped, and it looked to improve their ways. Many of the preachers believed that the gospel not only saved people, but also was a means to reform or change society. The enthusiastic preachers believed that every person could be saved through revivals. Yes, Angela, that's exactly right. And we're going to talk about those reform movements that it inspired. So the Second Great Awakening was extremely important as it led, and here's the question Angela had, to reform movements. And... To address the injustices, what movements, the temperance movement, temperance movement, the women's suffrage movement, and the abolitionist movement. And we're also going to talk about the rise of the black church. So the second great awakening um, is really going to push people to do something with their faith. And so women that accept, uh, that are converted through re these huge revivalist meetings are going to seek out ways to improve society. And one of the first ways that they do that is uh, through the temperance movement. But So let's go back here. I want to do this comparison again. The Second Great Awakening was a Protestant revival movement in the early 19th century. The movement started around 1800 and began to gain momentum about 1820 and was in decline by 1850. Uh, it says, sorry, that should be 1850. Revivals. So when you see this word revival, and Great Awakening, they're talking about the Second Great Awakening. These revivals were huge camps, and they attracted thousands of people there. And they sometimes could last four to five days. The Second Great Awakening was also different because it targeted African Americans, enslaved and free African Americans. 
And the message enslaved African Americans, when they heard the message of the, of the Great Awakening, they say, this is a promise for freedom for our people. And so you're going to see that, that the Second Great Awakening is going to plant that seed of hope that slavery will end. And we're going to see how that changes out. Charles Finney. So just like in the First Great Awakening, we had Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, the preacher in the Second Great Awakening, the main preacher was this man named Charles Finney, was one of the most well-known preachers. He inspired emotional religious faith using a speaking style that was high drama during his prayers and sermons. So here's a picture of, uh, yes, exactly. Dor Dorothea uh, Dix is a good name to bring up. She's going to be inspired here um, by these movements to improve society. So I know that, uh, sorry guys, I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. I hope you guys are still with me. I really appreciate what you guys in the chat when you guys ask questions and you guys answer those questions. You guys are the real MVPs. <laughs> All right. So here's a picture of Charles Granison Finney. And he's going to lecture just like Jonathan Edwards. And here's one of his uh, famous sermons. I know that, uh, I'm sorry, I know that is all so much algebra to those who never felt it. But to those who have experienced the agony of wrestling, prevailing prayer, prayer for the conversion of a soul, you may depend on it. That soul appears as dead as a child is to the mother who brought it forth with pain. So he's he's using language uh, and, and drawing ideas, basically saying that a, a, a soul that hasn't been saved is, is suffering. Okay? So same sort of preaching style, same sort of ideas uh, that were kind of encouraged during the first great awakening. All right. I don't want you to write this down because I want to just talk about this. Uh, the Second Great Awakening had many impacts. And I know this isn't the most exciting topic, guys, but I promise you there are questions on the AP. And I, my goal for all you guys is to get that four or five on the AP. Or if you're aiming for that three, that's what I want. And these are one of the topics that really come up all the time in the AP exam, the First and Second Great Awakening. So the Second Great Awakening enrolled millions of new members to various religious denominations. Okay? It increased... Uh, Protestant uh, Protestantism throughout the colonies. So I'm sorry, during, throughout the United States, it an increase in the Presbyterian, Baptist, and Seventh Day Adventist and Methodist. These are some of the new denominations that are growing uh, in the United States. Also, sometimes Mormonism is credited to this. The emergence of the movements to prohibit alcohol beverages, to support rights for women, and to further education. More women converted than men. The establishment of religious schools and Bible study groups. The divergence of religion between the North and the South. So this was an effect that now the North and the South are split religiously. The abolitionist movement emerges in the North. The pro-slavery movement emerges in the South. And we have an emergence in the Black Protestant Protestantism in the founding of the Black Church. Now, this is a lot of stuff. I agree. So I did you guys a favor, and I think if you just focus on three things, you're going to be okay. And here they are. We're going to focus. Uh, Zoe, algebra is just like, it was math. Uh, I think he's just saying like, look, math is confusing, and it's a uh, soul that's lost is confusing to the person that's lost. I think that's what he meant. So I want to focus on three topics. That if you can talk about these three topics in the AP exam or on a question, you're going to be okay. You don't have to remember all this stuff, uh, but it's good to be familiar with it. But I think focusing on three topics will help you. So first, we're going to talk about the emergence of the prohibition of alcohol, abolitionist movement, and the founding of the black church. So these were all effects of the second great awakening. So here's the first effect. The emergence of movements to prohibit alcohol beverages, to support rights for women, and to further education. Yep, the phone is ringing. Never mind that. It's, nobody calls me. All right. So if you, I really like this picture of these women here. Lips that touch liquor should not touch ours. <laughs> That's, uh, so if you guys are out there thinking for a Halloween costume, uh, this will be a great sign to carry around. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> all right, Andrew. 
All right. So is prohibition uh, of alcohol? Yes. It's not the same as a nexus on whiskey. A nexus on whiskey was a tax on whiskey. Prohibition is completely to make it outlaw, to outlaw alcohol. And so women begin to say, look, if we can get rid of alcohol, we can improve society. So they're inspired by the second great awakening and they begin to preach against alcohol consumption by holding up signs like this. Uh, it preached against all alcohol uh, consumption and it taught the salvation was possible through good works, inspired many people to become involved in social reform. Throughout the nation, temperance, this word temperance means alcohol uh, abstinence, like you're not drinking. So anti-alcohol societies formed to spread the word about the dangers of alcohol. So women that heard the message from the Second Great Awakening take that message, some women, and they, they decide if we can get rid of alcohol, we can improve society and live out the message of the Second Great Awakening. So this the, the idea of uh, prohibition, the temperance movement, this is a word that you're going to see a lot, the temperance movement. And so I, I don't want you guys to confuse it. Uh, the temperance movement is the same as kind of like the prohibition movement. It's to get rid of alcohol. And so the question here, yes, Abufo, hey, welcome. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were some serious problems with alcohol. Uh, many men were drinking alcohol, beating their wives. Um, they were neglecting their children. And so these women said, look, if we can get rid of alcohol, we can make better husbands, uh, better fathers. And we, this is a way that we can improve society. So one of the effects of the Second Great Awakening was the rise of prohibition or the temperance movement. OK, those words are key. You can't just say, oh, people uh, didn't like alcohol. You have to say women uh, really emerged as leaders in the temperance movement. OK, something like that. You got to use the vocabulary to get points. S the second effect, here's a picture of uh, Lo William Lloyd Garrison. And many northerners take the message from the Great Awakening as meaning that they need to fight slavery. They need to fight sin and they need to change the way things are. And so the se another impact of the Second Great Awakening was the abolitionist or anti-slavery movement. By stressing the moral imperative to end sinful practices and each person's responsibility to uphold God's will, preachers like Charles Finney led massive revivals in the 1820s that gave a major impetus to the later emergence of abolitionism. William Lloyd Garrison, he's going to take this message and he's going to, uh, he's nourished by the revivalism. He's, he, he, I'm not really sure, but I think he attends one of these huge revivalist meetings. And he decides that African Americans free. And he starts this newspaper called The Liberator. In the North and The Liberator, it plays a major role in the abolitionist movement. So let's review. The first effect of the Great Awakening was the, uh, that it led to this uh, women uh, fighting um, alcohol. And they fought for the prohibition of alcoholic beverages, also known as the temperance movement or the temperance society. Then you have this guy named William Lloyd Garrison, who's inspired, and he leads the charge in the abolitionist movement. And then finally, the, one of the last effects that I think you can know and, and make, a uh, make a difference is the emergence of black Protestantism and the founding of black church. So, hey, guys, you guys with me? I'm sorry, guys. I've been, uh, I've been kind of talking too much. Um, you guys with me? All right, Jason, guys, I truly appreciate you guys. Jocelyn, Vicky, my wife always says, why do you think, why do you thank them so much during the chat is because guys, I can't tell you like how grateful I am for you guys being here with me tonight, giving up your time and joining me. So, um, all right. So the second great awakening and, and the effect was the emergence of the of black church. So when Africans came, uh, they were brought to America by force through slave. They brought their own religion. And many of them did not want to give their, up their religions from Africa. Well, during the Second Great Awakening, the preachers began to preach to African Americans, and many of them began to become Christians. And here's an important phrase. Christianity becomes part of accepting America as home. 
So as African Americans become Christians, they essentially are adopting the religion of America, and they're essentially saying, look, I'm, I'm here now. This is my new home. I'm no longer African or associating with Africa. I'm African American. The first generation of African leaders emerges, uh, Richard Allen and George Liel, and women make up the majority of the black church and frequently took a, a, re, a lead role in the church. Many women could actually preach in the black church. And so now one of the things that's going to happen in the black church is that the people listening to the message are going to say, look, God has promised us freedom. And so remember, these are black preachers preaching to black, uh, a black congregation, and they're going to be talking about issues that matter to them, which is freedom. Did God really put us as slaves for the rest of our lives? And the preachers are going to say, no, they didn't. Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming, and this is going to inspire hope and uh, get people to fight back against slavery. All right. So we're here to this point now. Um, it's very important. That's a good question, Jason. Actually, I don't know. Uh, but it would make sense if her and Harriet Tubman were inspired by these anti-slavery movements. That's an excellent question, though. So one of the best ways to learn something is to compare and contrast. You can't compare and contrast something unless you understand it. So the first thing is, how were the first and second great awakening? How were they alike? So let's do this in the chat. How are these two concepts alike? Go ahead and put anything on there. What is the first? Okay, good. The related to religion. That's one. Perfect. Vicky, they were uh, responding to people falling away from religion. That's two. Both brought attention to religion. Both were religious revivals that influenced independent thinking. Perfect. That's four. They led to a uh, a reemergence of faith. Excellent. And the preachers were very passionate. That You could also think about that. Perfect. So here's what you can say. Um, here's something that I wrote down. They were marked by revivals and emphasis on moral and religious teaching. They were uniquely American movements, so they weren't coming uh, necessarily had to do with any, like Britain or anywhere else they were happening in America. They influenced new Protestant sects like Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, and so on. And they increased membership for women and increased religious diversity in America. Perfect. Libby, they had large masses gathered uh, to preach. And Mafus, both were attempts to reemerge faith. All right. So let's look at this. So when did they occur? This side right here is the first great awakening, and this side is the second great awakening. So let's compare and contrast. When did um, the first great awakening occur? Perfect. When this, oh, Hannah, <laughs> there you are. Uh, Hannah, you're exactly right. 1730s and 1740s. When did the second Great Awakening occur? Perfect. Uh, Jocelyn, 1800 to 1840s. Perfect. Who were the important preachers in the first Great Awakening? I gave you two. George Whitfield is one of them. And Jonathan Edwards. Excellent. Who was the preacher that we talked about that was important to uh, the Second Great Awakening? Finney. Excellent. George Finney. Excellent. So you guys are seeing that now you remember. It, it really helps you remember if you think about the first one and the second one. What was the message of the First Great Awakening? Uh, all right, let's look at it. No problem. Everyone is equal when it comes to religion. So look at the message. Uh, it was basically that there's, it's okay to question religion, that there are new lights and there are old lights, uh, that people that people can be saved, anybody can be saved, that we're all equal in God's eyes, and that God is angry, and that individuals must ask for forgiveness. Okay, that was the message of the first great awakening. 
The second great awakening that preached an ideal called perfectionism, and I didn't talk about that, which is the belief that people can strive for perfection, uh, life as a perfect human being. They believed that people could improve society, um, that it wasn't enough for you to be saved, that you had to go out there and make things right. Oh, sorry. What was the religious impact of the first great awakening? Okay, the, the impact was that people, uh, before that, people had stopped going to church, and they the impact was that they increased diversity, correct? It created different perspectives. It challenged the monarchy by saying that people, exactly, that people were basically equal. What was the religious impact of the Second Great Awakening? Correct, let be more people practicing religion, reform. Okay, and here, ordinary people. So what was the social political impact? Oh, I'm sorry, guys, I messed up here. I, I messed up the religious impact. Uh, I was me mixing up the religious impact with the social and political. So here's the social and political. Ordinary people felt they could connect with God and rely less on ministers. Many historians claim that the Great Awakening influenced the American Revolution um, and, and the notions of nationalism and individual rights. The Second Great Awakening influenced political participation of the common citizen. It played a role in the anti-bellum reform movements, abolitionists, temperance, prison reform, women's rights, mental health, and education. And, I, and somebody in the chat brought this up about uh, mental health. So guys, take a screenshot of this. I actually shared it as well. I'm going to share it again. The complete. This is a great way to review uh, because it helps you uh, contextualize the first and the second. And so I put the document there. Make a copy. Share that with your friends, guys. I'm I'm thankful you guys are here. All right, we're almost done. I want to do some SAQ practice. And here's. Uh, no, Stephen, that's a great question. It didn't cause the Enlightenment in America, but it was influenced by the Enlightenment. Huh. Has something in the way? Hmm. All right, let me see. I'll try to fix that. All right. Vicky, so briefly describe how the second great awakening. So here was an other question from the AP exam, a, a AP practice book. All right, let me see if I can change it to a Google Doc. Mm. All right, let me see. Okay, give me one sec, guys, as I make the document so you guys can have access to that. And uh, you don't have to write that down. Sorry, guys. All right, so let's really quick as I'm doing that, can you guys really quick just write your answers and practice here? Uh, these are questions that appeared from the second great awakening on the AP practice exam. Okay. Okay, so briefly describe, this is where I wanted somebody to come on the chat. Got any brave souls want to come on here and talk about this? Oh, guys, so far all day today I've been denied. Might as well be high school. Ask people to prom, no. Ask people to homecoming, no. Had to go by myself. Anyway, this isn't therapy. I'm just talking about myself. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, that was tough. But actually, uh, I had a good time at prom by myself. I didn't need anybody there. No, don't worry, Vicky. You're great. Thank you for being here. All right. So let's look at this. So briefly describe how the Second Great Awakening impacted African Americans. It led to the rise of African American churches. Uh, just this answer by Julia right here is perfect. All right. <laughs> All right, Julie. <laughs> that's pretty funny. All right, that's pretty.
good. Uh, all right. <laughs> oh, that's really good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, what are you doing to me? All right. So briefly describe how the Second Great Awakening impacted the temperance movement. Oops. How did it impact the temperance movement? Correct. Mahfouz, it gave them a sense of belonging. They left their old sense of religion from Africa, and now they were adopting Christianity believing that this was basically an acceptance of uh, of being an American now. So perfect. So how did the Second Great Awakening impact the temperance movement? Perfect. Guys, I want you guys to, uh, it decreased alcohol consumption. That's actually great. Um, it led to a higher involvement of women. Look at this answer by Julia. Um, now a little bit more. And I mean, obviously this is a perfect answer. I know that I'm giving you guys short time, but this is a perfect example of an answer that would get you there, uh, get you a point. The second great awakening contributed to the emergence of resistance to alcohol consumption and women emerged as the leaders of the temperance movement believing that they could improve society um, and that they had a moral obligation to do that. Now, the third question, and they love to do this in the AP exam, briefly describe another impact of the Great Awakening apart from the two listed um, above. So what was another impact? Somebody keeps calling me, wow. All right, there you go, Vicky, you got it. It gave rise to the abolitionist movement. And if you talk about um, the rise of public health institutions, but remember the feminist movement, I um, I think that's that would be hard to prove there. I mean, I can see where you're going, Angela, but that would be hard. But think about the three things we did talk about. We talked about the abolitionist movement right here. And so if you brought up William Lloyd Garrison, uh, the impact and, and the fact that he was impacted by the Great Awakening and this led him to create the Liberator, uh, which played a role in the abolitionist movement, that would get you a point. Remember, guys, in the AP exam, the way you get points is by bringing in the key vocabulary. So you can say something like, oh, I gave rise to the abolitionist movement. Yes, you're right. But then you have to give specific examples. That's where you have to know the name of William Lloyd Garrison, the Liberator, um, I, and other things that uh, other people that were involved in the abolitionist movement. Okay. Just that enough will give you a point. Zara, I do love your profile pic. Excellent. All right. And this is the last question. This was an AP question. And I want to see if you guys can get this. This is a multiple choice. Don't put your answer yet. I want to give everybody a chance to read it. And then in one minute, you put your answer. Don't put your answer yet, or you get disqualified and lose. 1,000 points. Sorry. All right, so, uh, sounds like everybody's done. Go ahead and put your answer there. What do you guys think? Okay, so let's go through these answers. Um, so what was one of the most important implications of the Second Great Awakening? The Second Great Awakening tended to reduce social class differences among men and women. I can see how this seems. Let's keep that answer. This, this is a hard one. So we'll keep A. Remember, when you're doing multiple choice, your job is just to eliminate what's wrong. Because of the strain of populism that ran through revivals, this movement promoted religious diversity. Ooh, that one seems right as well. So let's keep A and B. 
Because of the informal camp meetings, the second grade awakening discouraged church membership. Actually, no, it didn't. It encouraged. So C is gone. Uh, the second grade awakening weakened the women's social position. That's wrong. So we're down between A and B. And we know that many. this would take many years for women and men to actually uh, be more equal. So it, maybe it did reduce it, but it didn't. That wasn't the tendency. So the correct answer to this AP question is B. So guys, um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight. I know, <laughs> all right, Angela, I saw you were the first one. Um, it's great to practice. Um, I want to thank you guys for giving up your Monday night to be with me. And this wasn't the most interesting topic in the world, but you guys were here with me. I know that if you paid attention today and you went through it, uh, Jason, thank you guys. Thank you, Zoe. You guys are so awesome um, that that this is you can answer these questions on an AP exam and get those points uh, so you can uh, pass that AP and get that college credit. So thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I want to I want to wish you guys a good night and bye, everybody. <laughs>